happens when someone feels like their identity has been challenged. Around the world, people are asking themselves what it means to be European, what it means to be Scottish, to be British, to be Polish, yes, even what it means to be American. But starting a talk on autonomous vehicles about identity, that, that may seem a little strange. But we've heard from lots of people today, people who are men and women, students, professors, singers, all these are identities that any person can hold at any given time. So when you think about autonomous vehicles or autonomous technology, what do you think of? The Terminator. <laughs> A uh, romantic comedy about the 38th governor of California uh, <laughs> traveling back in time, finding love, and saving the world. How about another one? I, Robot. The story of a young man from West Philadelphia, born and raised, <laughs> attacked on the playground by a gang of murderous robots, <laughs> and then sent to live with his auntie and uncle in Bel Air. <laughs> All right, well, one more, one more. Ah, a Dalek from Doctor Who, its famous catchphrase, exterminate. For all the Doctor Who fans in the room, yes, bow ties are cool. <laughs> really, Doctor Who, in my personal opinion, is one of the greatest British exports. Uh, my personal opinion, uh, and like this speech, is my own and not that of the British governments. But uh, when we look at these depictions of autonomous technology and pop culture, they're almost wholly negative, something to be feared. Well, I'm here today to tell everyone that we have nothing to fear that autonomous technology will never get so advanced as to be able to do basic human tasks like opening doors. And as long as that is the case, we can rest assured knowing that we are safe from destruction at the hands of our robot friends. Uh, I, I guess that concludes my TED talk. <laughs> It, uh, it was a pleasure knowing you all. <laughs> that video recently went viral. And the reason it went viral was because there's something deeply unsettling about seeing a robot do a task that has almost wholly been something that human beings could do. So my contention today is that that fear of autonomous technology is actually a fear of change, a fear more specifically, a fear of the world changing in such a way that it challenges one of our most basic identities. No, not that of owning a car, not whether you're an Aston Martin or McLaren fan, a stick or an automatic, hard top or convertible. No, something even more basic than that. It's a fear that autonomous technology will challenge what it means to be human. I want to delve more into this idea by looking at three main points. First, why are we talking about this now? Seems like a problem 100 years from now. Two, how will autonomous transportation change our daily lives? And finally, how should we respond to this advance in autonomous technology? In the automotive industry, autonomy is viewed on a scale from zero to one. I could talk for an hour on this subject alone, on what it will take to get from where we are to where we have fully autonomous vehicles. But what you need to know is that on this stage, on this level from zero to five, we have already reached level three. Leading experts in the UK and the US think that we'll reach fully autonomous vehicles as early as the year 2025. Not really uh, something that's a long ways away. But it's just theory, right? What about preparation? If it's going to happen by 2025, we, we should be preparing, right? 94 cities around the world have already started either piloting or preparing their infrastructure for autonomous vehicles. 34 in the USA, 9 right here in the southeast. Okay, so theory, preparation. Um, what about something even more than that? Implementation. Already at London Heathrow Airport, autonomous pods have transported 1.5 million people, 1.8 million miles, without any accidents. In Milton Keynes, a city in the UK, they just ordered a fleet of autonomous taxis that will take people around their downtown area. What about in the air? Flight. Yes, autonomous flight. 
Already, autonomous drones are being used to deliver much-needed medical equipment into inaccessible areas of Africa. So, theory, preparation, and implementation, it's, it's already starting. Yet, according to a poll recently conducted by Morning Consult, 58% of Americans don't trust self-driving cars. 44, 45% of people don't believe autonomous vehicles were ever fully replace human drivers. Just last week in the New York Times, a quote from a 2020 presidential candidate said, all you need is self-driving cars to destabilize society. Hmm. Well, that's the prevailing mood. That's what people think. But yet we see that it's on the way, that it will be here soon. But all this is cool, but, you know, it's information, it's statistics. You know, what is the idea worth sharing? Well, the idea worth sharing for me is what I like to call level six. What is life like with a fully autonomous future? How will cars, autonomous vehicles, change our lives right here in the USA? Here in the USA, we're, we're pretty spread out. And so for most people, most families that can afford to, everyone in a family of driver age gets a car. But imagine with an autonomous vehicle. Car can take your kids to school, can come home, take you to work, come home, take your partner to work, come home, and if Spot the dog is well-trained enough, it can take Spot to the park and back. <laughs> well, what if we're not talking about autonomous vehicles per person? What if we're not even talking about them per family? What if multiple families are sharing an autonomous vehicle? Does that change the way you view your car? Hmm. Well, how do we even choose cars? In autonomous vehicles, everything is programmed into their hardware and as a reaction to their environment. It doesn't matter if your car can go from 0 to 60 in 2.5 seconds or if it can go 220 miles per hour. Those statistics no longer matter. You know, if, if that is the case, then, you know, if all cars are functioning exactly the same, no different, then does a car now become a commodity, like an apple? How do we choose our cars? Will we be going to the car lot and saying, well, you know, it's a nice car and all, but it, it doesn't include the standard refrigerator, and I just, I don't know if I could have a car like that. Or, or maybe we'll hear conversations like, well, you know, this year's model is great and all, but really a 4K screen, I think I'll hold out for the hologram next year. Our front seats aren't even going to have to look forward anymore. No longer will you have to strain and listen to the person in the back the person in the front leaning forward saying, what's that? I, I can't quite hear you. We can now have conversations. But with, with all of this, with, with uh, all this luxury comes other questions. How do people who rely on $500, $1,000 used cars survive in a world where it's illegal to drive your own car? Think about public transportation, the bus. Buses will no longer be required to stop at fixed points. Imagine you get on a bus. Your phone tells the bus exactly the address you want to go to. The bus then runs an algorithm of everyone inside the bus to see how they can get everyone closest to their destinations most efficiently. But if that's the case, then all of a sudden public transportation is competing with the likes of Uber, Lyft, private industry. What does transportation become then if it's all the same service? What if it's no longer about the car, about the service? Really, what if transportation becomes something less of a necessity and something that we view as a fundamental right? Uh, at times they are changing. What about, what about the efficiency of vehicles? There'll be less vehicles. They'll be operating at peak efficiency, which means less vehicle emissions, which means less carbon, less pollution, which means a more sustainable world. Think about safety. Think about in a world with autonomous vehicles not having to worry about accidents. That's two million less accidents a year, one million less injuries, 30,000 lives saved every year just from autonomous technology. Think about the time saved from our first responders, our fire, police department, emergency services. Think about where that time can be used to save even more lives. 
Think about our time. How, how much time do you spend a day driving in a week, in a month, in a year? All that time can be spent doing other things. It can be spent thinking, feeling, creating, talking. The whole breadth and depth of human imagination can be done instead of spending time driving your car. Imagine the world we can create, how much better that we all together can make the world. Yet despite this idea, you know, to change where the world will go, it's still, if I showed you that video again, you'd still feel that same reaction. And even though, even though the world is going to look uh, a lot different um, from everything that I've told you today, that world that I've just created is all the effects of automation on one industry, the automotive industry. Imagine that level of change that I've just depicted and illustrated for you. Imagine that happening in every single sector. A, a recent Aston Institute study showed that uh, by the year 2050, potentially up to 60% of jobs could be affected in some way by autonomous technology. Look to the person beside you. One of your two jobs will be affected by autonomous technology. All of a sudden, that fear of change, that uh, fear that our identity as humans could be challenged, especially in a culture where so many of us define who we are by what we do. All of a sudden, that fear seems somewhat reasonable, even justified. So how should we respond? Maybe a, a, another way of saying that is, what should you take away from what I've said here today? What you should take away is that the world, the future, is autonomous. It's not a question of if, but a question of when. And you know what? Even though there isn't anything that we can do as a general public to affect the research and the implementation of autonomous technology, what we can control is our reactions to these changes, our attitude towards this new world. Automation doesn't have to challenge our identity as human beings if we don't let it. Rather than a challenge, the implementation of autonomous vehicles and autonomous technology should be used as an opportunity. An opportunity for us to grapple with what does it really mean to be human. Yes, the <laughs> world's going to look different. There's going to be some changes. But that change in circumstance is not something that we fear, something that we lash out against, something that divides us. It should be something that we embrace. Yes, new conversations are going to have to be had. Conversations about the affordability of transportation. Conversations about the impact of autonomy on the workforce. Yes, even conversations such as universal basic income will become very real debates right here in the United States. But as we have these conversations, in a time now that seems where division has prevailed, we are fast approaching a day where we will face something more radical than an idea worth fighting for. Instead, it will be an idea worth uniting for. And as long as we face our future with charity for some, equity for all, and above all else, an approach that we do not let fear dictate the decisions we make together, with automation, we can create a better world, a safer world, a more sustainable world where we not only survive, but we thrive in our identity as one humanity. Thank you. <laughs>